All right, here we go. Today we have one of the greatest soul music singers and songwriters of all time. The man who wrote over 4,000 songs, including timeless classics like The Tracks of My Tears, Cruisin', Tears of a Clown, My Girl, Being With You, and hundreds more. Grammy Award winner, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame member, musical icon and legend on every level, Smokey Robinson. We're truly honored to welcome you to Vlad TV. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. Well, it's our first time here. I'm a huge, long-time fan. Bless you. Thank you. So I want to start in the very beginning. So you grew up in Detroit. I grew up in Detroit, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And your father had a very interesting story. Yeah, my father had a yeah, yeah my father had a very interesting story, in fact, because he had run away from home when he was 12 years old. He was born in Selma, Alabama in 1896. Mm. And uh, he ran away from home when he was 12 years old and um, never talked to or saw anyone in his family from that day forward. Well, the reason he ran away at 12 years old was because he had stabbed a white kid yeah. that was trying to bully him. Yeah, yeah this, this white boy. My dad was, uh, like I said, he was 12 years old when he ran away, so the stabbing didn't happen until he was 12. But since he, he was 10, he had a, a paper out. Uh, a guy in the city had a bunch of the young black boys delivering papers to the barber shops and the stores and the this and the that and so on. And um, he made uh, something like about 53 cents a week, I think, something. I mean, a month. And, um, you know, from the time he was 10 years old, this white boy who was about... When, when he was 10, because the boy was 17 when my dad was 12, so so he was about 15, and he'd just take my dad's money every time he got paid. You know, and my dad wouldn't tell his brothers because my dad was the youngest of nine siblings, and he had some older brothers. But he figured if he told them they did something to the boy, then the white people were going to come to his house and kill everybody in there, you know, so, so he never told them. And uh, so when he was 12 years old, you know, he said he just got tired of it. And one day he saw... Boy Scout knife for two cents, and he bought it. It had the can opener and the this and the blade and so on and so forth and so forth. And that month when he got play, paid, the boy came to take his money again. And he said, I'm not giving you my money. And the boy slapped him down. So he just jumped him and stabbed him in the legs. And the boy started screaming and crying and all that. So he ran, and he said he was going to go home, but he thought about it. And I don't know how he thought about this at 12 years old, but he said, he thought about it. He said, if I go home, they will come and find me and kill everybody in my family. So he went to the railroad track, and he got on a freighter and never looked back. At 12 years old, he went from Alabama to Detroit. No, he didn't go straight to Detroit. Well, where'd he go? He went to a lot of places in between. You know, uh -huh. he was, yeah, he just grew up on freight trains and stuff like that with wow. some other hobo guys and like that, you know. And um, so he said he didn't settle down until he was 19, and that was in Cleveland, his first settlement for a permanent place to stay was actually Cleveland, Ohio. Mm. But uh, yeah, and uh, uh, when, I was, when I was a kid, when he first told me that story, I, I felt really bad for him. And I felt, you know, gosh, that's a, that's a terrible thing to have to go through, which it, which it was, you know. But after I got grown, who I really felt sorry for was my grandmother. I can imagine that. Her baby, you know, like I said, he was the youngest of nine siblings. He leaves his house one day in Selma, Alabama. And, you know... <laughs> 1906, you know, yeah. and she never sees him or hear from him again. So I can imagine what she must have been thinking. You know, it, was, it had to be really, really, really rough on her. Uh, okay, but in your family, okay, there was 11 kids? No, uh, 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 there was 11 kids for me because after my mom passed, my mom passed when I was 10. Uh -huh. There was only three of us. I had two older sisters. Okay. And my oldest sister was 17 when I was born. Hmm. And my youngest sister was 14 when I was born. So my mom passed when I was 10. And then my oldest sister, who had six kids of her own by that time, um, came back to live in the house. And she ended up having 10 kids. So that's how my nieces and nephews are actually like my brothers and sisters. Uh -huh. And uh, there, were, there were 11 of us. Okay. So here you are growing up with all these kids, essentially in the ghetto. Uh, essentially. <laughs> Actually. Actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually in the ghetto, in the hood. <laughs> right. And your mom is, has passed away, your dad is still around, and your sister has now brought her kids over. So you have all these kids in a house trying to scrape by, yeah. essentially. What do you think was 
you know, I mean, you're a kid, so you don't really realize how bad things are. But in retrospect, what do you think was the worst things that you went through during that time? Oh, gosh, I, I really don't know, man, because I, I tell people all the time, you know, there were a bunch of us, there were, you know, 11 kids in a, in a, in a house as small as our house was, you know, um, you know, I, I slept with two of my nephews mm -hmm. in a little bed that was about as big a size as a, as a twin bed, you know. So we were all piled up there and everything. But we didn't know we were poor, man, because everybody in the neighborhood was under those same conditions, you know. So I didn't realize I was poor until I moved out of there. <laughs> After I started singing and moved away, <laughs> then I recognized the fact of the poverty that I'd grown up in. But it wasn't really bad because... We had love, and we loved each other, and we had a great family love, and we had a great family tie. And, uh, you know, uh, so w we weren't thinking about how poor we were because everybody was like that, mm. you know. And um, But when I look back on it retrospectively, we, we, were, we were poor, you know. Um, we, we, we had nothing, you know, and we never locked our doors or windows and nobody in the neighborhood because if somebody was going to break an house, they better be bringing something, you know, because <laughs> there was house nothing full of to take. Yeah. There was nothing to take, <laughs> that's for sure. Okay, and at age six, that's when you actually uh, wrote your first song? Uh, yeah, well, maybe not when I actually tried because I, I, I've been trying to write poetry and stuff like that. All my life, so I I, I had written a, a, a couple of little songs before the six year old song, which uh, was actually because my auditorium teacher uh, in elementary school, uh, her name was Mrs. Campbell, and she would have us do plays and stuff like that, starting at the first grade, you know, up to, up to the eighth grade of schooling, and went to the eighth grade, and she would have the kids doing plays and doing talent shows and things like that. So um, I was in first grade. We were doing this play about Uncle Remus. Do you know who Uncle Remus is? Not. Okay, Uncle Remus is an old folklore black guy. Folklore. He was the one who told all the kids how the animals got to be like they are. Why the zebra had stripes. Why the tiger had stripes. Why the pig had a curly tail. He told the kids about how all the animals got to be like they were. So my teacher decided she was going to do this play about Uncle Remus. And I'm playing the part of Uncle Remus. Okay, so uh, at the beginning of the play and at the end of the play, she had this little melody that she would play on the piano. And uh, one day we were rehearsing. And I, and I asked her, I said, Mrs. Campbell, I said, can I, can I write a song to the, she, she said, oh yeah, baby, go ahead, do it, you know. So I did, and she liked it, so she let me sing it at the beginning of the play and at the end of the play. And, um, so that was my first song that anybody other than my mom and me had heard, and my mom was in the audience, and you would have thought I was somebody like George Gershwin or somebody like that, because my mom just, I mean, my mom, I tell people, she called people she didn't even know. You know, my baby wrote this song. <laughs> you know, this episode. So that was the first one that anyone ever heard uh, when I was six. So were you like a, a natural singer or did it really take time to develop your voice and lessons or church or something of that sort? Well, I, I did, man, you know, and especially my sisters, you know, <laughs> they're both gone now too. But they told me when, 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 I, when, when they were younger and when I was getting like to be 12 and all like that. They said, man, we used to be so mad at you because on Saturday and Sunday, when we didn't have to go to school, you would get up singing to the top of your voice, waking us up at <laughs> seven, eight o'clock in the morning. And we'd be so mad. And then mom would say, no, leave him alone. Let him sing. You'll be glad he sings one of these days, you know? And so she said, we hated you because we got up every morning singing. So I've been trying to sing all my life, I guess, you know? Well, by age eight, you actually met Aretha Franklin who lived around the corner? Yes. Okay, and she was six at the time. Yes, Aretha was six when I first met her. Was she singing at that point already? Like she, damn near like she was singing when she was grown. Wow. <laughs> you know, when I first met Aretha, uh, they had moved from Buffalo, New York, to Detroit. And one of my closest friends in my neighborhood, a guy named Richard, brought Aretha's brother, Cecil, who he and I became really, really close all of our lives. But he brought him around one day and said, this is a new guy, this is a C, so we were shooting marbles. And um, and uh, so we said, okay, well, where you live? He said, I live next door to Richard. So we went around. And in the middle of the ghetto, there were two blocks that were plush. And I, to this day, cannot figure out how or why that happened. Because I lived on a street called Belmont. 
and Belmont was in the hood, and all the streets east of that were in the hood. And then just west of Belmont was Boston Boulevard and Arden Park, which were two blocks. And they actually had, they weren't gates, but they had like wall arches and stuff going onto their streets. And that's where the affluent people lived. Mm. And I mean, they were plush. They had lawns, they had big homes, they had all that, you know. And so they were just in the center of the country, right after you passed by Arden Park, which was the second one, the ghetto started again, you know. It was like, uh, gosh. But anyway, um, so uh, Cecil took us to his house to see his new house. And he lived on that street on Boston Boulevard, the Flush Street. And um, so we went in, and I had never seen all the ornaments and stuff like that in a house like it was in his house, you know. And I heard some music coming from a, a, a little room, and uh, I, I went and peeked in because I was always in. And here's this little girl sitting there playing the piano and singing Amazing Grace. Mm. And she's playing the piano down there like she was playing when she was grown and singing almost like that, you know. Age six. At age six. So I was wow. fascinated by her, man. So I stood there and I listened to her, and then she saw me, and we sat up, you know, and I, I tried to sing Amazing Grace with her, you know. and But, uh, you know, that was when I met her. Well, yeah, I mean... Aretha went down as arguably the best female singer of all time. Uh, in fact, Rolling Stone just did a top 200 singer list, and they put her as number one. Oh, great. Yeah, they put Whitney as number two. Great. Would you agree with that ranking? I, I don't know, because Aretha was Aretha and Whitney was Whitney. Yeah. And they were both great singers. Yeah. You were number 23 on the list, by the way. I was what? Yeah, you were number 23 on the list. Oh, okay. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah, why not? <laughs> if you don't list that all. <laughs> well, okay. Well, and then by age 11, you actually put together your first group, The Five Chimes. Yes. Okay. And with your childhood friend, uh, Ronald White and Pete Moore. Yes. So, and that was the first time you actually were singing in a group? No, it wasn't the first time I ever sang in a group. We had a group in elementary school, but it wasn't anything. It was just, mm. you know, four guys, we'd get together and just sing sometimes. But it wasn't like when I started the chimes or when we started the chimes. Uh, we were serious about it then, you know. There were groups everywhere in our neighborhood, and uh, we wanted to compete with them. So we started our group, and uh, Ron and, and, and Pete and I. And uh, we had two other guys singing with us, a guy named James and a guy named uh, Clarence. And eventually they quit, you know, before we started the Matadors and evolved that into the Miracles and all that. Uh, they had quit. But, uh, yeah, we started when I was 11. We were singing in elementary school. And we, we used to love to sing and sing because that attracted the girls. Right. The girls came to hear us. You know? <laughs> so that, that, was, that was motivation. Was it, you know, were there other kids in your school who had green eyes or were you kind of unique? In that respect, I don't remember anyone who had green eyes other other than me um, at that point. No, yeah. I wasn't paying attention, but I don't remember anyone. I'm sure that kind of stood out to the girls and everything else like that. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, in 1952, you were 12. That's when you met Diana Ross. Yeah, and she lived four doors down. Four doors down the street from me. Okay, and she was a little bit younger than you. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And was she singing back then? Um, not when I met her. I didn't even know she could sing. Mm -hmm. yeah, when I found out she could sing was when she moved away from the, from the block. She moved to a place called the Brewster Projects. And after we started Motown, she called me one day and she said, Hey, Smoke, I got this group, you know, and uh, I want you to hear us so you can sign us up in Motown. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I said, okay. I didn't know she was a singer till then. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Well, she wrote a book at one point, and she said the two of you actually were dating at one point. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did that last a long time, or was that just sort of brief? And well, it lasted uh, probably longer than it should, because I was married at the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so this happened later. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. that happened later. Okay. That happened after I got married. Uh, you know, after I got them signed up in Motown and all that. That's when uh -huh. that started. Okay. Um, well, when you were fourteen, this was nineteen fifty-four. Uh, Aretha Franklin actually had her first baby. She was 12 years old at the time. Mm -hmm. Were you guys still close during this time? We've been close all of our lives since okay. we first met. Yeah, we, yeah, we were close. H how did she really react to that, being so young to, to have a child? Well, of course, being as young as she was, uh, to be pregnant. When she found out she was pregnant, she panicked, yeah. of course, you know, because, uh, you know, 12, come on now. 
So she panicked, and uh, she was highly upset about that. But, you know, there it was. Yeah. And so there was nothing she could do at that point. Right, have the baby. Absolutely. Okay, so here you are growing up in Detroit, and you have your musical group. But, you know, you guys aren't making money yet. You guys are still sort of building up. And you yourself weren't really getting into trouble, but people around you were. You had friends that were robbing gas stations. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a friend who actually died uh, trying to steal Christmas cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, one, one of the guys I grew up with, um, he was, but he was one of those kids that everyone, when we were little kids, he was always getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, he uh, he was breaking into these people's car because he saw some Christmas cards on it was during Christmas season. And he saw a bunch of Christmas cards that hadn't been, you know, they were in a box. And they people, go, I guess they were going to mail them out to their friends or whatever. And he saw them on the back seat of the car and he was breaking into the car. And police saw him and shot him. Or oh, the police killed him. Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. And there was a situation where I guess you guys were playing baseball with some white kids. Okay. And uh, a fight broke out. Yeah. With bats. Yes. And uh, how, how were you involved in that fight yourself or did you try to that kind of stay out of it? That was the fight that broke me up from fighting period yeah you know it was horrible even when i look back on it because i had never been in a fight like that before you know i had a lot of fights when i was growing up you know but i'd never been in a fight like that where boys were hitting each other in the head with baseball bats and knocking each other out with baseball bats and and that kind of stuff you know it was just crazy so that that right there stopped me from being involved I, I might have had a couple of fights after that, but they were singular, you know, but the, that fighting with a group of guys and stuff like that, that was horrible. So I never did that again, ever. Right. You're basically scared straight. Absolutely. After that. Yeah. Which, you know, being in that area with your friends getting involved, because I mean, your friends would offer to have you come along to go rob gas stations and you you turn them down. Well, yeah. It, see, because I, I, I when my kids were growing up, the one rule that I have with them is never come to me telling me anything about peer pressure. Mm. That you did it because your friends did it or so they suggested that you do it. Don't ever tell me that. Because I grew up with some gangsters. You know what I mean? Yeah. I grew up with some dudes in the hood and they were my friends and we loved each other. And they would come to me and say, hey man, come on, we're going to rob the gas station or something. No, I'm not robbing nothing. I'm not right. At our house, like I said, you know, there were a bunch of us there, man. So our house was a gathering place in the neighborhood. There would be nothing but 30 kids to be at our house at the same time of all different ages because we were of all different ages. All my nieces and nephews in there. And, you know, I'd say, okay, man, you know, you, you rob guests if you want, but I'm not going with you. Yeah. And I'll see you tomorrow because I knew that if they were alive and if they were free, they would be at my house the next day because that's where everybody hung out, you know. So, yeah, sometimes they would be there. And they would have five, ten dollars a piece or somewhere they'd rob somebody or something like that, you know. And sometimes uh, someone would be in juvenile when we were young and, and then we got older, they'd be in jail. And sometimes they would be dead. Yeah. So, yeah, so, but they always came and they were still my friends and we loved each other and we hung out and we did all that, you know. So I told my kids, don't, if your friends love you, they're your friends. I mean, they don't, they don't care if you do wrong with them. You know, if you don't do wrong with them, then you're not their friend or they're not your friend. Those are not your friends. Anybody who approaches you with that, if you got to do something wrong to be their friend, that's not your friend. So don't, don't even count them as a friend. And don't come to me telling me you did it because they did it. Because if you come to me and you did it, I'm going to figure you did it because you wanted to. So don't tell me about peer pressure because I don't, I don't believe in it. Well, at one point, you guys actually renamed yourself from the Five Chimes to the Matadors. Yeah. And you guys went to audition uh, for, was it Jackie Wilson's manager? For Jackie Wilson's managers. And it did not go well. Didn't go well at all. But it, Well, no, no, I'll take that back. <laughs> I mean, the, the audition itself didn't go well. No, the audition didn't go well, but it was the beginning of a new life for me. Right. You know, so it went well. It, it was more of a go well than it was a not go well. Yeah. As it turned out, you know, it was, it was, it was a blessing that they turned us down like that, mm -hmm. you know, because Barry Gordy, who was writing all of his songs for Jackie Wilson at that time, was at that audition. 
and he liked a couple of my songs that we sang because we sang all original songs, thinking that Jackie Wilson's managers would say, oh, yeah, they got their own material, let's sign them. You know, they didn't like us because we were too much like the Platters, who were four guys and a girl, and they were the biggest group in the world at that time. And we had four guys and a girl. And Tony, who was the lead singer of the Platters, had a high voice. I had a high voice. <laughs> so they figured, they said, no, 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 the Platters are already out there, and you kids will never make it because of the Platters. But Barry happened to be at that audition, and we sang songs that I had written rather than something that was currently popular. And that caught his attention. And he came outside after we got through being rejected by the managers and started up a conversation with me, wanted to know where he got the song. So it was a God day for me, you know? Right. And then the two of you started actually working together. Yes. And Barry, uh, Barry Gordy, Gordy had a, a reputation and a track record. So he was writing Jackie Wilson songs, yes. a lot of his big hits, as well as a lot of other songs yes. and so forth. He was a really prolific, not only was he, you know, destined to be a big label exec, but he was a prolific artist himself you know, a producer, songwriter, and so forth. Yeah, but he wasn't an artist. He, he, yeah, well, that's what, by artist, I mean, Oh, okay. you know, just generally. Yeah, yeah he wasn't actually a vocalist. Creator. <laughs> Creator, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, so you guys start working together, and the first single comes out, Got a Job. Okay, yeah. First single comes out, Got a Job. I was looking at uh, American Bandstand one day. Uh, in fact, the day that the silhouettes who were a very popular group at that time, and their their number one record was probably number one in the world at that time, was Get a Job. Right. And so I saw them singing that and getting the gold record and everything, and the thought came to me, Get a Job. Well, why not write Got a Job, which right. I did. And uh, so that was the first record that the Miracles and I ever had out, but it was on end label out of New York because there was no Motown at that time. I mean, were you guys the Miracles at that point, or did the name change start after that? Uh, it, the, the name changed after we recorded the record, because before the record came out, the name changed, because uh -huh. Barry didn't think that the Matadors was appropriate for Claudette, who, who was in our group, you know. Right. So we put a bunch of names in a hat and picked one out, and I, it just so happens that I put the Miracles in there and picked one out, and it was, it was the Miracles. So that's how we became the Miracles before Got a Job came out, because we needed a name for the label. Okay, so Got a Job comes out. Was it a hit or? Yeah, it was a hit. Yeah, it was a hit. It was, it was, at that time, there were three charts. There was the classical chart. There was the, what they call the pop chart. And the pop chart was had people like Elvis Presley and all those people like that on it. And then there was the black chart, you know. So uh, Got a Job was in the top five in the black chart. So we knew it was a hit and we were hearing it all the time. And um, so, yeah, it, it, it was a hit. Okay, and then that next year, 1959, you and Claudette actually got married. We actually got married. And you guys were together since you were like 14 or so? Yes. Okay. Why get married that young? Because I thought I was a man. Hmm. I thought I was a man and I thought I was ready for that. I thought I was ready for life. And Barry had just started Motown and I had a job. I was making $5 a week. And, uh, you know, she was the executive secretary to the head of the YMCA for all of Michigan. And, you know, Crawley was a brilliant girl. She um, she graduated from high school when we were 16, you know, and she did, I mean, girls were doing shorthand at that time and she could do like 500 words a minute, <laughs> some, some crazy stuff like that, you know. But she had a job and, uh, you know, and I had a job, I was making $5 a week and, and she had been my girlfriend like since I was 14 and we had started uh, d doing a few gigs on the road and what have you, you know. And I thought I was a man. I thought I was grown. I thought I was ready for that, you know? And I think about that all the time. If one of my kids had come to me when they were 19 years old and say, I want to get married, I would say, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about, you know? But uh, it was a different time then, a different era. And um, so, yeah, we got married when I, when, I, when I was 19. Well, around that time, there wasn't a Motown yet. It was Tamala Records? No, there wasn't even a Tamla at that time. You know, that was that was that was uh, uh, that that was just before the first Tamla record came out. Aha. Okay. Yeah. Because because then Tamla Records formed, but then it got renamed Motown Records. Well, Motown was the original name. Uh, Barry wanted the first label to be Tamla because at the time. He thought it sounded popular because Debbie Reynolds had the number one record in the world, a song called Tammy. Hmm. Tammy's in love. 
So he said, Tammy. And so he just made it Tamla. And that was the first label that was released. But Motown was always the original uh, title. Okay. Why the name Motown? Because we, because at the time, Detroit was known as the Motor City. Ah, because Motown. All the, Motor, yeah, because okay, all, the, all the all uh, the auto plants and yeah. stuff. Yeah. That's where they were based in Michigan and mainly in Detroit. So they called it the Motor City. Mm -hmm. And then so Barry just took the mo off of that and Motown. R rest is history. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then that next year, 1960, you're 20 years old. And you put together Shop Around. Yes. Which took you 25 minutes to write. Yes. When you wrote it, did you know you had something on your hands or was it just another song in a long list of songs? No, uh, I, I wrote Shop Around because Barry, uh, we, had a, we had an artist there named Barrett Strong. And Barrett Strong had a record called Money, That's What I Want. The best thing in life are free, which Barry had written for him. And Barry wanted a follow-up to that. You know, he said, man, I want you to record some songs on Barrett. Because his, you know, money, that's what I want, was a big hit. So I, I, I thought about what you do with money, you shop. Hmm. So I, I wrote Shop Around, and Shop Around was one of those songs that just flowed out. It took about 20 to 30 minutes before the whole song was done, you know, and I was very excited about it. Uh, and uh, I went and showed it to Barry, and when I showed it to him, he said, no, I want you to sing it. Mm. So I said, no, man, this is for Barrett. He said, no, 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 I want you to sing this song. We went through 20 minutes of that. And he finally said, hey, man, just go in the studio and record this on You and the Miracles. I like the way your voice sounds on this. So I did. I went in and I recorded it. And Barrett Strong, as far as I was concerned, was a bluesy singer. And the best thing in life for you, da 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 all it was bluesy. So I recorded Shop Around bluesy, because that's how I imagined Barrett singing it. And it was slow and bluesy and blah, 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 with the piano curls and all that in it, you know. And um, so I recorded it. And uh, then the Miracles and I went on the road. And we came back and uh, uh, we had gotten back in town one evening, probably about maybe midnight or so. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, my phone rang. And I was wondering who's calling me at 3 o'clock in the morning. I picked up the phone. I said, hello, and it's Barry. He said, hey, man. I said, yeah. I said, well, what's up, man? He said, uh, what you doing? I said, what am I doing? I said, I'm, I'm sleeping. <laughs> I said, what are you doing, man? He said, well, shop around won't let me sleep. I said, what? He said, shop around won't let me sleep. He said, you gave it the wrong treatment. It's not right. I said, oh. He said, yeah, man. He said, I'm, 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 I'm going to re-record it. I said, we record? I said, Barry, the record's been on the air for two weeks. I said, how are you going? He said, I don't care. It's a great song and it's not right, so I'm going to re-record it. I'm going to change the beat. I'm going to change the sound. I'm going to change everything about it, and it's going to number one. So I said, okay, he was him. you know. So I said, okay, man, let's go with me. I'll see you tomorrow. He said, no, right now. I said, right now? He said, yeah. I said, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. He said, I don't care. He said, I called the musicians. You get the group, y'all come to the studio right now. So we went to the studio at 3 o'clock in the morning. He had changed everything. All the musicians showed up except for the piano player. Barry played the piano on it himself. And we recorded Shop Around, and it became the first million seller for Motown ever. Okay, so the new version was totally different from the original? Totally. Really? Night and day. Aha. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, okay. And that becomes Platinum, the yeah. first Platinum record on Motown. Was that song sort of about your own situation? You know, when you look at the words, you getting married at 19 no, and, and so no, forth with your no, first girlfriend? No, it really wasn't, man. Not consciously. <laughs> consciously, it was about shopping. It okay. was about, you know, because he had the record money. That's what I want. I want some money. Okay. Give me money. And so, so that's what you do. So consciously, that's what it was about. Uh -huh. Now, subconsciously. <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, during those early days when you guys started touring, I mean, you're you're born and raised in Detroit, but suddenly you have to go down to the Deep South and start touring around. And now you get introduced to a whole bunch of really scary situations that you're not familiar with, you know, where you can't stay at a motel. You can't eat at a restaurant. There's whites only signs yeah. everywhere. And you actually got shot at by using the wrong bathroom once, right? Yeah, well, well we didn't even get a chance <laughs> to use the bathroom. Huh. Uh, we didn't even get a chance to use the bathroom. We were going to use it, but uh, the proprietor at the gas station had a shotgun, you know? 
and no niggas was going to use his toilet. <laughs> so that's, that's what it was about, you know. <laughs> and then we got shot at after a concert one time, you know. Really? Yeah. How, how does someone really deal with that? You know, because obviously there's, there's, there's racism all over America, but the Deep South has a different type of racism. Well, you know what, man? Uh, my mother was born in Memphis, and my grandmother lived in Memphis for all of her life. And my mother would take me there from the time I was born to see my grandmother. Oh, so you've already and, and, spent some time down there. So Yeah, so I had spent some time in Memphis, and um, I, I kind of knew the Jim Crow thing of the South, you know, because of that. But never like I experienced it once we started traveling. It was never that because I was at my grandmother's house and she lived in a black neighborhood. She lived in Orange Mound. And, you know, wasn't none of the black people out there. So I didn't experience until, you know, like a white person would come down to the neighborhood to do something or something like that. And everybody was this because the white person was there. So that was basically what it was. I didn't experience any white violence until I started to tour. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 1961, that's when Diana Ross actually signed to Motown. Okay. Right? So so you, she went through you. Yes. And now she signed. And that same year, Stevie Wonder signed to Motown. Okay. 11 years old. And I guess uh, when you first met him, you asked uh, if he could sing. And he goes, yeah, I sing better than you. <laughs> you know, Steve was always a character. Stevie's a... Uh... Stevie's my brother. He's my man. I, I love Stevie. Stevie, I tell people all the time, you know, Stevie's blind, but he's never been handicapped, man. Yeah. He has never been handicapped. He just, just happened to be blind, but you know, but yeah, he was he was a feisty little dude, you know. And 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 Ron White, one of the guys I sang with in the Miracles, discovered Stevie because Stevie went to school with one of his little brothers, and his little brother told him about it, and Ron went to hear him, and he brought Stevie to Motown, so. Yeah, I mean, Stevie went on to win 25 Grammys, if not the most Grammys from a single artist, definitely right there. Uh, sold over 100 million records mm -hmm. over time, and all that while being blind. Yes. But he could play, from what I understand, every instrument. Any instrument you put in, uh, around him. <laughs> yeah, he could play it. <laughs> okay. In fact, he and Marvin Gaye used to have battles. Really? Oh, yeah. Stevie Marvin. Instrument. Huh? Stevie and Marvin used to battle. Yeah. Who would win? Oh, well, sometimes Marvin would win, sometimes Stevie would win, because they were playing everything. You know, they, okay. They played, they played, Marvin was a hell of a drummer. You know, In fact, when he first came to Motown, before he got a hit record, he was the drummer for the Miracles on Me on the road. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This was before he signed to Motown or after he signed? No, he had signed, but he, he just signed, didn't have a hit was, yet. He was still doing jazz. He, he wanted to do it. He wanted to be like Nat King Cole or... Yeah. Frank Sinatra or somebody like that. That's how he wanted to sing. And he didn't want to sing rhythm and blues music and that, you know. But, uh, yeah, he was our drummer. Well, in 1962, you wrote my favorite song, You Really Got a Hold On Me. All right. Uh, which went on uh, to be inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame. Yes. And the Beatles actually covered this song. Yes. And let me tell you, I listened to the Beatles version this morning, and uh, it doesn't really hold a candle. To your version. And I'm actually well, a Beatles thank fan. You. <laughs> thank but, you. But it, it definitely was missing the soulful aspect well, of the song. You. Did you like the Beatles version? Of course I liked the Beatles version, man. The Beatles recording one of my songs. Are you, <laughs> are you kidding me, man? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right. Well, the Beatles actually said in some of the interviews that they're always just trying to do, do a Smokey, essentially. I was absolutely... Flabbergasted when they re when they recorded my song, man. Mm -hmm. Of course, and then it, you know it really got a hold of them. It's been covered by so many artists at this point, you know, country, western. Just you know, it's been one of those songs. Like I said, when I wrote it, I didn't expect all that from from that song. I just wanted to record something bluesy uh, because Sam Cooke had a record out at the time that I really loved. He and Lou Rawls were singing it together called "Bring It On Home to Me." And I wanted to write something with that flavor on it, you know. And um, so that's what that's how you really got a hold of me came to be. But I didn't expect it to become what it has become. And you actually knew the Beatles before they, they blew up. Yes. Did you see the potential in these four kids early on? N no, I didn't see their potential of being 
the Beatles like they became, yeah. <laughs> you know, because we met them in Liverpool. Uh, they were playing at a little club in Liverpool, and the, the promoter, we did a gig, the Miracle and I did a gig in Liverpool, and the promoters took us to this little club afterwards just to hang out, you know, and the Beatles were playing there. And uh, so they were, they you know, they, they were a nice band, you know, but I didn't expect them to become yeah. uh, Beatles. <laughs> right. <laughs> And there was actually what ended up being a fake quote. Uh, Bob Dylan allegedly called you America's greatest poet. You know about this whole story? Yeah. So I guess he didn't actually say it. Like the publicist put it out there. Or? No, no, Bob said it. I know so Bob, Bob did say. It. Yeah, I know. Okay, because there, there was some some weird. Yeah, I've known Bob it. for years, man. Uh, okay. Yeah, I've, I've known him. I met Bob, man, in probably about 1971 or something like that. Uh, his he had a girlfriend named Sarah. And uh, when I first started to move out to Los Angeles from Detroit, so it had to be 72, um, I, I took an acting class. And Sarah was in the class with me. And Bob used to come and pick her up. So that's how I met him. Um, and this was before he said what he said, you know. And he and I have talked about it since that time, you know. Okay, so that's a real quote. Because on quote. the internet, people are saying it wasn't real. But I'm glad you actually cleared that up. He yeah. called you America's greatest poet. Yeah. And... I mean, Bob Dylan was an icon, you yeah. know, himself as well. So yeah. to have him say something like that, I'm yeah. sure resonated. Yeah. Okay. Well, that next year, 63, Martin Luther King actually came down to Hitsville? Yes. What was it like to meet MLK at that point? It was uh, um, regal. Mm. You know, he was him. And... Uh, to basically most people in the United States at that time who were not bigots, he was a regal figure. You know what I mean? So he came to Motown, and it was very humbling to be in his presence because he was him, and he was doing something that was making an impact on not just the United States, really the world. And uh, to hear him say what he said was even better than that. He came because he wanted to record I Have a Dream, and he wanted us to record that speech, which is on Motown. Really? Okay, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, Have a Dream speech was on Motown. Aha. So that's why he came, because you know, we were hot at the time. And he said, you guys are doing with music what I'm trying to do legally, mm. you know. He said, and you're doing it and it's happening automatically, which means so you're actually helping me, you know? So that was wonderful to hear from him that he said that because exactly that was happening because we were breaking down barriers, man, and bringing people together with music. Right, because you were doing shows down south where you would go to the venue and there was literally a rope in between the venue with all black people on one side and all white people on the other. Yes, or all white people upstairs and all black people downstairs, or vice yeah, versa. Exactly. You know, yeah. They were not mingling. Yeah. You know, but they were all there because they had a common love now. They had this music. Yeah. That the white kids loved and the black kids loved. So they had a common love. So, yeah, they were, they were separated. They were separated physically. You know, but they were beginning to be um, segregated emotionally. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, they were good to get together emotionally because they had this common love. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that next year, 1964. Not segregated because they were yeah. already segregated. Uh, uh, unsegregated, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, didn't you refuse to do certain venues if they continued this whole rope in the middle thing? No, not actually. What happened was one night we were, we were, we were playing and then we had a, a Motor Town Review, and we were playing somewhere in the South, I forget where it was, and the rope was in the middle, and the white kids were on this side, and the black kids were on this side, and uh, the Miracles and I were closing the show, and we came on, and a ruckus started, you know, between some white boys and some of the black boys on the other side of the rope, you know, and I just stopped the band, I stopped everybody, I said, wait a minute, not tonight. We came here, this, this is love music. I told him, I said, this is love music, and that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to love each other. 
Well, I told the police, I said, take the rope down, you know. So they took it down, and and um, eventually we would go, man, and there'd be white boys that were black girlfriends, mm. and vice versa, black boys that were white girlfriends, and they were mingling, and they were dancing, they were, you know. Music is powerful, yeah, man. power of music. Yeah, music is powerful. Well, in 64, you wrote My Guy for Mary Wells. Okay. Big hit. Okay. But then, as a almost a response record, you wrote My Girl for The Temptations. Okay. Which became your biggest song ever. Okay. When you wrote that, did you realize what you had on your hands, or was it a bit of a surprise? Um, I, I, I would tell you the same thing that I told you about. You really got a hold on me. Um, whenever I go into the studio... I want to have a song. I want to have a song that, had I written it 50 years before then, it would have meant something to people. Mm. Today, when they hear it, it's going to mean something to people. 50 years from now, it's going to mean something from pe for yeah. people. You know, So that's my approach to it. So my girl was inspired by the fact that uh, the temptations, all of them, could really sing, and they were just, I mean, their harmonies and their 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 uh, vocal presentation was powerful, you know. I tell people all the time, I could have brought the original group of them, well, not the original, original group, but when David Ruffin came in the group, I could have brought David and Eddie and Paul and Melvin and Otis into this room right here and say, hey, man, sing ooh, and they say, Ooh, and it would have shook this room, cause that's how that's how they were. With Melvin way down on the bottom, Eddie way up on top, they could just sing, you know. So the first hit that they had was a song that I wrote called "The Way You Do the Things You Do," and I used Eddie Kendricks to sing the main lead on that. But I did it because the basics of the song is them singing harmony with each other. God smiles so bright, and then they're singing harmony with each other. And I figured, well, hey, this is, you know. So I used Eddie Kennedy to sing the basic lead on that song. And at Motown, every artist was always open to every producer and writer there. It was never a fact that if you had the last number one record on this artist, you could automatically get the next record because you had the last number one record. No. Mm -mm. You had to beat out everybody who recorded, recorded some songs on that artist at that time in order to get that next record. So the guys at Motown, the producers and the writers, they jumped on Tim Temptations bandwagon and they started using Eddie Kendricks for all the lead vocals. You know, Eddie Kendricks, girl, why you want to make me do all those songs? They used Eddie Kendricks for it. And, and I, said, I knew that David Ruffin and Paul Williams were in that group who were awesome singers. In fact, the first song I ever recorded on them, I had the first record that ever came out on them in, ever, was a song called I Want a Love I Can See. And when they first came over, Paul was actually the basic lead singer, you know? And I used him to sing the lead on that song. But anyway, everybody jumped on the bandwagon, Eddie's singing all the lead. But I knew Paul and David were in that group. And David especially, David had that, that voice that, I figured once people heard that sound, you know, cause, uh, and he had that rough baritone tenor voice, you know? And I figured if I can get him to sing something sweet, the girls would love it. <laughs> So that's why I wrote my girl because yeah. because I wanted him to sing something sweet to the girls, so so the girls would love it, and that's that was my that was my point, and uh, so I recorded it on them, and then the Miracles and I left town, and um, at that at, at that period of time, um, if you were a producer at Motown and you had a number one record, then you got a thousand dollar bonus check for having that number one record. So the Miracles and I left town, and we came back in town, and uh, Barry called me to his office, and uh, my girl had been out for about two weeks, I guess. And he called me to his office, and I went to his office, hey, man, what's up? We, blah, 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 blah. And then we, okay, here's your check. And he gave me the check. <laughs> I said, here's my check. I said, what is this for? He said, man, you got a smash hit record. So I thought he was talking about on the Miracles and me, and I said, well, we don't have a new record. I said, what you talking about? He said, no, no, no. He said, <clears throat> my girl. He said, it's only been out there. He said, but it's just jumping up the charts. Mm -hmm. He said, it's going to number one. 
So here's your here's your here's your here's thousand dollars. Money. I didn't expect my girl to become what it has become. It is now, as a songwriter, my international anthem. Yeah. You know what I mean? We these two people sing with me and play with me and stuff. And we go places, we sing my girl, man, and as soon as they hear bum 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 bum, they know what's happening if we're in Italy and people don't even speak English. They know what's happening, man, and they all sing it. Oh, so, yeah. So it's uh, it's it, it like you really got a hold of it. Went beyond my wildest dreams for it. Right. I mean, on Spotify. I mean, we're talking about. Uh, I mean, almost sixty years after it came out, uh, it has seven hundred million streams on Spotify. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, way after the fact, there was no yeah. Spotify back then. The fact that so many people came back and continued to listen it's, to it. It's amazing, man. It, it is amazing. Yeah. Uh, okay. That next year, will you guys change your name to Smokey Robinson and the Miracles? Yes. You dropped uh, Ooh Baby Baby, but then you dropped the Tracks of My Tears. Okay. Which I guess is the second biggest song that you did with the Miracles? I, I don't really know, man. I know the biggest song that I ever did with the Miracles was Tears of a Clown. Right, exactly. That's why I say yeah. this is the second biggest. Well, maybe. Yeah. I'm not sure. Well, uh, that song got you know, inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame. And uh, in 2021, Rolling Stone did an article where they called it the greatest Motown song of all time. Wow. You didn't know that? No, I didn't know that either. <laughs> I mean, there's a great argument for it. Yeah, that's, that's I mean, would you consider wonderful. that the greatest? Motown song of all time? It's wonderful, man, because Motown has had some great songs. I know, song. right? <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Well, that same year, was that when you first started producing Marvin Gaye? Because you did uh, Ain't That Peculiar and I'll Be Doggone. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll Be Doggone was the first song that I ever produced on him. Um, and Ain't That Peculiar followed uh I'll be doggone. It didn't follow it exactly because the, the, the head of our sales department, a guy named Barney Ailes, who was one of my closest friends too, uh, felt like they, they, Marvin had a song he recorded called Pretty Little Baby. And I'll Be Doggone came out, and it was the first kind of like mild hit that Marvin had really had, you know. So uh, it came out, and uh, and Barney put out Pretty Little Baby after that rather than Ain't That Peculiar. And it flopped, didn't do anything, and then Ain't That Peculiar came out and kind of revitalized him. Did you realize how great Marvin was going to become back then? Because this was before, you know, what's going on and everything else like that. You know, I, no, 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 no. Because see, I, I don't have a crystal ball and I, could, I couldn't have known how great he was going to become, but I knew that he had the potential and he was good enough to become that great. He was one of the best singers I ever heard. Mm. To this day, yeah. he is still one of the best singers I've ever heard. I agree. And I and, and I felt like that when I heard him singing the Christmas song at the Christmas party before he was even signed to Motown. Mm. You know, he was singing. He came to Harvey Fuqua, who was the the founder and leader of a group called the Moon Glows, and Marvin was singing with them at the time. And Harvey also had started working at Motown, and he brought Marvin to the Christmas party, and Marvin sat down and started playing the piano, and singing the Christmas song, and hearing him then. I knew he had the potential to be who he became just from his voice. Well, in 66, uh, you wrote Get Ready by The Temptations. Huge song. In 67, you guys put out I Second That Emotion, which later on, Diana Ross and the Supremes actually redid. Right? It was, it was a collab between you guys. Is that correct? Uh, no, they they maybe did it on their own, but you know, like a lot of people have recorded that song too. Right. Thank God. <laughs> well, and then in 1968, the Jackson Five show up to Motown. Mm -hmm. You were actually there. Yeah. Okay. So you got this group with Michael Jackson, who was what 11 at the time or 10? I thought he was 10. Yeah. Okay, 10 years old, and they're actually singing your song. Who's no, they didn't sing my song Wait, that day. Who, who's loving you? No, no, they didn't sing that that day. Okay. Yeah, well, what were they, they singing they came, that day? They sang a couple of James Brown songs. Okay, and, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and Michael was a little James Brown. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, he yeah, Michael was awesome at that point. You know, and they, they and, and they could sing. They could really sing really good for young boys like that. 
but Michael was dynamic. He was 10 years old. Yeah, I mean, you say that you don't have a crystal ball, but when you heard Michael Jackson sing for the first time, did you suddenly see what was about to happen? I, I, I knew that once they got a hit record, they would probably be big because they were so talented. Yeah. When they got there, they were talented. Right. You know, so uh, I knew that if they got a hit record, they would be big because they were young boys, they were kids, and they were that talented. Yeah. When you heard Michael Jackson doing uh, Who's Loving You, which he, you know, people think that you're doing his song <laughs> when That's you're right. singing that. That's right. <laughs> when he's actually doing your song. Well. But he he killed it. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. I'll, <laughs> I'll take people thinking it's his song because he put the song on the map. Yeah. You know, it, it was it was it was just a mild, it was a mild hit because it was on the back of Shop Around mm -hmm. for the Miracles and Me. Was in the, and after a while, radio turned it Shop Around over and they started to play Who's Loving You by the Miracles and Me. So it was a mild hit, you know, by us. But then here comes this little, I think he was about 11 when he recorded that. And I always say, I say it to this day. He sang that song like no one had ever sang it. And how could an 11 year old boy even know what that song was even talking about to sing it that well, you know? <laughs> yeah. But everyone that you hear singing it now is imitating Michael. Yeah. They started with his wing, all, all, you know, he, he just put that song on the map. Thank God. <laughs> Well, uh, that same year, uh, your son Barry was born. Yeah. I guess your wife had six miscarriages leading Seven. up to this? Seven. Mm -hmm. Seven miscarriages. I I've never even heard of an amount that high. Yeah. How, how heartbreaking was that to just go over that over and over again? Well, it was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking because um, the one that stands out, the, well, the two that stand out the most to me are the first one and the last one. The first one stands out because... We never, ever dared to dream that we would have a miscarriage. When she got pregnant, we were just happy. Oh, we're going to have a baby. Because that's why she had come off the road. You know, she came come off the road, and she got pregnant. She came off the road so we could have this baby, you know. And uh, we were elated. And I'll never forget the guy. We called this company that had strollers. They had different strollers in this brochure. And we liked one of them. And the guy came out to the house to demonstrate it to us. And he said, this is so-and-so, so-and-so, and so and so and it goes this and blah, 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 and you do this and the wheel does. And he said, and in case, God forbid, you have a miscarriage, we take it back. And I thought to myself, oh, miscarriage? We, we're not going to have a miscarriage, you know. Uh, sure enough, you know, um, we, we, went on, we went on the road, and um, I got sick, and I had to come home. And so the group, the Miracles, went on on the rest of the tour. It was a motor time review. They went on to the rest of the tour because it was Christmas time. And everybody was trying to make some money for Christmas and so on. And uh, they went on. <clears throat> and uh, one night, my phone rings. I was in the bed sick. I was here. Uh, I was uh, in Detroit. And I was in the bed sick. And, and one of my nieces was staying with me because Claudia was still on the road and so on. She was staying there. And she brought me the phone. She said, it's Mary Wells on the phone. So I said, Mary Wells. And so I got on the phone and said, hey, what's up, baby? She said, smoke. She said, you need to make Claudette come home. And I said, why? He said, she said, because she is bleeding profusely. Hmm. And she's pregnant. She's bleeding out here every day, and she won't come home because she says she wants the guys to make some money for Christmas. Brother. I said, okay, fine. I said, put her on the phone. And I told her, I said, you come home tomorrow. If you don't come home, I'm getting about this bed. I'm coming to get you. You come home tomorrow. Yeah, but the guys got to make some money. I said, I don't care about that. I said, they got to understand that. You come home. So she came home, and um, she ended up miscarrying, you know. And so that that was a, you know, that stands out to me because it was the first one. And then there were others in between that. But the last one were, were twins. They were oh, wow. uh, two girls. And um, I was in New York. The Miracles and I, we were playing at... Uh, at uh, Radio City Music Hall. And uh, I get this call from my niece. And she says, uh, and it just so happens that it was the last night, thank God, too. And um, she said, uh, can, can you come home uh, tomorrow? I said, yes. I said, why? She said, because Claudia went to the hospital. She said, and, and, and they think she's going to have it because we didn't know it was twins. She thinks she's going to have the baby because she's seven months now. So we, we, we think she's going to have the baby. And she, so you need to come on home. So I came home the next day, and by the time I got there that evening, 
she had gone to the hospitals and the babies had been born, but they were preemies. Yeah. And since there were two of them, their respiratory systems didn't get a chance to fully develop. So they both died. And I went and I saw them, you know, they showed them one looked just like her, one looked just like me, you know. And so we buried them and, you know, did a whole ceremony and stuff like that. But those two are the ones that stand out. But in between those, we had miscarriages. Yeah. Well, you finally did have a baby that year. Yeah. In 1968. Mm -hmm. That same year, Martin Luther King got assassinated. Yeah. As someone that actually met him and the impact that he was making in America during that time, how hard that hit you? Oh, that hit me really hard. That hit me really, really, really. See, because um, it's almost like we were going through an era where all of our top men were being assassinated. You know, I can remember how unbelievable it was to me when I'm looking at TV and they come and they say, we interrupt this program to say that the president has been shot in Dallas, Texas. The president of the United States, John F. Kennedy, can be shot, can be assassinated at this in this time of life. Yeah. I mean, you know, Abe Lincoln, okay, that was a whole other thing. But at this terror, at, th at this time of our lives, the president of the United States can still be assassinated. That sent me for it took me a long time to recover from that man, you know. And then they kill Martin, you know. So it's just like compounding, uh, you know, uh, uh, here these guys, all these top men, these top political figures are being assassinated right. in the United States of America. Yeah, because Malcolm X was killed two years before yeah, that. Yeah, Malcolm. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. Malcolm. You know, it, it's just, it was just a, a series. And then right after Martin, here's Bobby. He gets, you know, yeah. they were just killing our top leaders, man. And, um, and so, yeah, it was, it was, it was very impactful. Well, after having your son, you actually wanted to leave the group and mm -hmm. retire from touring. Yeah. But then, Tears of a Clown yeah. happened, which is actually the only number one hit during the time with the Miracles, right? Um. Gosh, I don't remember, but man, I, I, I know think it was. It was, yeah. it was the biggest record around the world. Yeah. That, we, that we had ever had. I know that. Right. And uh, Stevie Wonder actually brought you the, the instrumental originally. Yes. Stevie bought me that track. We were at a Christmas party and he bought that track. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, yeah, I got this great track, man, but I can't think of a song to go with it. So listen to it, see what you come up with. And bum, 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 but dun 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 is the circus. You know, that's Barnum and Bailey, Ringling Brothers. That's their theme. So that's the first thing I heard when I put the track on. Right. So, I mean, it sounds, I mean, in terms of the content, I was listening to both the songs uh, this morning and the tracks of my tears and tears of a clown kind of have a similarity in terms do. of the theme, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was that intentional or not really? Uh, not really. Not at, not at the time. It really wasn't. Uh, like, Because like I said, uh, tears of a clown, uh, that was my uh, personalized version of Pagliacci's life. You know, uh, Pagliacci... Like I said, to this moment, I still don't know if he was mythical or real, but I'd heard his story when I was a kid, when I was in elementary school. And so I wrote that, like a personalized version of Pagliacci's life. And uh, Tracks of My Tears was started um, with my guitarist, who was the source of so many songs for me, Mark Tarplin. And he had given me that music. And... Um, so I, I would listen to it all the time because his guitar riffs, you, you used to, I used to have them put me to sleep sometimes, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I finally came up with the first three lines of the chorus one day. Uh, uh, Take a good look at my face, see my smile looks out of place, you look close, it's easy to trace that you're gone and I'm here. No, that's not it. I went to a thousand. No, that's not it. And one morning I was shaving and I thought to myself as I was looking, I don't know why I thought it either, but I thought to myself, what if a person had cried so much till their tears left tracks in their face? That was it. So. Right. So now you're back in the group again for a few years touring off the success of the song. Tears of a Clown. Exactly. And, and that same year, the Jackson 5 dropped four number one hits in a row. Mm -hmm. I Want You Back, ABC, The Love You Save, and I'll Be There. Mm -hmm. So Motown's on fire at this point. Yes. 
And then that next year in 71, your daughter was born. She was born in 70. Tama. Tama. Named after the, the original after record, label. record label. Just like how your son is named after Barry Gordy. Mm -hmm. So you and Motown are forever <laughs> linked <laughs> yeah. in all types of ways. Yes. But in that same year, Marvin Gaye dropped what's going on. Okay. You said this was your favorite album of all time. Still is. You were with Marvin when he was working on this. Yes. And I guess he said that... Uh, he said that God is actually writing the album for him. He said him. God was writing it, yes. When you were working with him, because you didn't actually produce or write any of the records, did you? No. Okay. I wasn't ever working with him. I was just listening. Yeah. Yeah. He lived right around the corner from me. And we'd get together every day yeah. to do something, play some basketball or some golf or run or something, you know. We, we were always hanging out doing something, you know. And I went around to his house because he wanted me to hear what he was working on. And um, God was writing it because it's prophecy. Yeah, I mean, that was a hell of an album. Yeah. I mean, that was really, and, and in terms of Marvin, like, up until that point, he was like the crooner. He was doing love songs, and this was a total 180. Yeah. And what a 180 it was. Like I said, it's prophecy. You listen to it when you leave here. Everything that he's talking about in that album is happening way more now than it was even happening when it came out. At that time, was Marvin going through the drug issues? Not, Not severely, not like he... Okay, no. th that happened later on. Yeah. Okay. Well, in 72, you had your last performance uh, with your group. And then you were actually uh, replaced by Billy Griffin. Yes. Was that a relatively easy transition or was there some bad feelings over you leaving? Because you are the star of the group, and the lead uh, singer. No, because, you know, like the Miracles and I had grown up together, man. Like I said, I knew Ron and Pete since I was 11 years old and Bob since I was 14. So we had grown up together, and we were brothers, and um, had it not been for them being who they were, I never would have continued on after Tears of a Clown came out, you know? But they came to me and said, man, hey, you know, we got a number one record, and it's breaking, up all, it's breaking out all over the world. We're gonna make more money than we've ever made, and so, so you cannot leave. <laughs> they didn't ask me if I was gonna say, you can't leave. <laughs> so <laughs> they told me. I couldn't leave. So I said, you, you guys are right. So I went for another year. And then uh, I told them, hey, you guys start looking for somebody now because I'm not going to be involved in that because I don't have to be with the person. I don't even have to know them. But you start looking for somebody now. So they auditioned guys from all over the country. And they finally came up with Bill Griffin, who was from Baltimore. And, um, you know, he, he went with us on the last four or five dates of my farewell tour with the Miracles. He went with us and to, to see the show and watching that, you know. Okay, so essentially after that last show, you somewhat retired yeah. for about a year? No, 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 I retired, for, yeah. For how many years? Uh, I, I, I actually retired for three years. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but then in 73, you had your first solo album, yeah. Smokey. Yeah. And then... Which was a mishap. Yeah. Yeah. I, then, did, I didn't intend to record that album. Why is that? I, I never intended to record that album. I didn't. Re I didn't want to record anything at that point. I was done. It was it. That was. I was done with that part of show business. Right, because you were you still know? the vice president of Motown yeah. during that time. And I figured I'm gonna go and I'm gonna do my job as vice president. I'm gonna write some songs and produce some other people, but not me. I'm done. You know. And so I wrote this song called Sweet Harmony, which I dedicated to the Miracles. And so I went and I recorded five discs and I was going to give it to them. Just each one of them had their own copy of Sweet Harmony because Sweet Harmony talks about you got this Sweet Harmony, so you keep on going. I'm not going to be there, but you can make it without me because I'm, you know, don't worry about it because you got what it takes to make it without me. So that's what the song was about. So at the time, this lady named Suzanne DePass was our A&R director at Motown. So I played it for her. And she said, oh, no, Smoke, the world has got to hear this. I said, no, babe. I said, I, I don't want the world. It's just for the miracles of the person. Oh, no, no, no. But the world needs to know that this is how you feel and blah, blah, blah. And, blah, 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 and so and so and so. She went through that for two days with me, you know. So I finally said, okay, put the record out. So she said, okay. So she got, got pressed up and all this stuff. And um, they were getting ready to put out uh, Sweet Harmony as a single. 
And then she came to me and said, you know, we're going to need an album for this single. <laughs> what? You don't need an album? <laughs> you say it. But anyway, um, I ended up do, doing, doing, doing an album for that particular song because, you know, she had said so. And then uh, my guitarist, Marv Tarplin, he was still with the Miracles, but he had left by that time. And he came out to Los Angeles to be with me so we could write some more songs. And when he got there, he and his girlfriend had started a song called Baby Come Close. And um, they had the first verse of it, and he played it for me, and I loved his guitar playing. <laughs> and so I said, oh, I said, that's really, really pretty, you know. And so they said, well, why don't you finish up and record it? You've got to make an album. And so I recorded that, put that on the album, and it came out, and it became like a mild hit, you know. So the radio was playing it and so on and so forth. And I'm thinking to myself, nah, I'm out of show business. I don't want to do this or be this or anything. But uh, that's that's why I recorded that album. Well, but the next year you came out with another album, yes. Pure, Pure Smokey, which yes. didn't do all that great, unfortunately. No. Yeah. I, I wasn't into it at that point, man. I really, you know, I was just doing what they were asking me to do. I, was, I wasn't thinking about being an artist or being making records and all that. I, w I wasn't really into that. Well, the next year you did your third album, your third solo album, A Quiet Storm. And that had- That was intentional. That was intentional, right. Mm -hmm. And the agony and the ecstasy was on there. Mm -hmm. And was that based on a on an affair that you had while married? Not that I know of. Oh, okay. <laughs> My bad. Sorry. No, <laughs> no man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the internet's not always right, but okay. Well, what's interesting about that year, we had just interviewed uh, this guy named Peter Shu. He was a street guy from New York. And he talked about an incident where one of his friends was actually killed at a show that you were doing at the Apollo. Oh, yeah. You know about this? I didn't this. know that it was his friend. Yeah, yeah, a guy named Dell. Yeah. Um, for, you know, that was basically assassinated in, while, the, in, the, in, in a the private theater, balcony. While, while the show was going on. Yeah, yeah he was exactly. killed and two other people were shot. Two, yeah, yes, exactly. You remember that when that I happened? Remember, yes, I remember like it was yesterday. We're on stage and we're singing something slow like, ooh, baby, baby. I don't remember exactly what the song was. And we're pop, 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 pop going, you know. And so the next thing I know, they're running. People are tackling me, pulling me off stage. And everybody's running off the stage, the band, everybody, everybody's running off stage and come to find out that this guy had done something to somebody and they came to the theater to kill him. And they did. And, and during the course, they were shooting like that. They accidentally shot two other people. Yeah. They didn't die, but they killed the guy that they came to kill. Yeah. It was a mess. Yeah. Was that the only time something like that's happened at a show? Yeah. Yeah. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. Thank God. Well, that was, that was deep. I didn't know, know what was happening. Well, that next year, you put out uh, Smokey's Family Robinson album. Okay. Didn't do huge numbers, unfortunately. No. Uh, well, George Harrison actually put a, a track, Pure Smokey, on his album. Yes. Which was one of your songs. Yeah. Were you and George Harrison like- No, 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 no. George actually wrote a song about me. Oh, okay. Th that's about you. Pure yeah. Smokey's about you. Yeah. Aha. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. Um, and that same year, Stevie Wonder drops Songs in the Key of Life, mm -hmm. which was his biggest album mm -hmm. ever. Were you involved in, in, I mean, you didn't produce on it, but were you around when he was putting this together? Of course I was around. Yeah, yeah. And, and I was very happy for him because it was going to be his first time he got a chance to produce himself. Yeah, it's a hell of an album. Yeah, he and hell Marvin had always wanted to produce themselves. And, uh, you know, he it was his first time he got a chance to produce himself and he kicked ass. Yeah. Yeah. Did he? Yeah. Well, in 77, he did the Deep in My Soul album. And then in 79, you dropped the Cruising single. Mm -hmm. And I guess you'd been working on that song for five years. Yes. And uh, Marv uh, Tarplin actually brought you the guitar riff mm -hmm. initially. Exactly. Why did it take you that long to put that song together? Because some of your other songs, you're talking about 20, 30 minutes, you're done. And well, this thing here well, is five uh, th years. Th 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 it's a contrast between shopping around and that, uh, you know, songs take different times to write. And I don't, I don't like to, to do them until I feel like I've at least got something to go into the studio with that makes sense. And um, so Marvin had shown me this music. 
of him playing the music to be, uh, to uh, cruising on tape like he always did. He gave it to me, and it was so sensual. Mm. It was so sexy. It was like I I I, I don't I, well it was on a reel to reel uh, cassette tape, so I know I, I don't have it now, but I wish I did because it was so sensual and so sexy. I used to loop it and let it put me to sleep at night. It was just so, you know, so I wrote a couple of songs to it. They were not sensual nor sexy enough for his music, you know. So I'm still working on it. I'm working on it. Working on it. And one day after a few years, I guess two, three years, I came up with the first lines of the chorus. It's like Tracks of My Tears. Uh, you're going to fly away. I'm glad you're going my way because I love it. I love what? Uh, 20 of those. I love it because of this and that and so on and so forth. And um, none of that was cool. <laughs> so one day I was driving down Sunset Boulevard in the wintertime with my top down. You know, <laughs> I'm thinking, golly, it's December. <laughs> I'm riding down Sunset and it's 80 degrees. And I got my top down. <laughs> you know, this could never happen in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm cruising down Sunset. What? Cruising. Cruising. Boom. So I turned around <laughs> went back home and sang that to the tape. And that's how cruising. Yeah, and that became your biggest solo song ever. Mm -hmm. Still got 60 million streams on Spotify. All right. D'Angelo remade it. Yes, he did. I love the D'Angelo version, by I the way. I do, too. You do, too? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I surprised him one time. He was doing a, a, a show, BET or something like that, and he didn't know I was going to be there, you know? And uh, he started, he got up on stage, he started playing cruising, and I came walking out ah. and sang it with him, you know? Okay. But, uh, yeah, but yeah, D'Angelo. Yeah, I mean, that first D'Angelo album was just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And I felt that that was like one of the crown jewels yeah. of, of that project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm not a big fan of, of, of remakes a lot of times, but that right there, I think he really, oh, yeah. he really killed it. Well, I'm a big fan of all my remakes. <laughs> Whoever remakes it. <laughs> yes, I'm a big fan. You never had a remake where yeah, you're like, you're like, oh, like the Beatles I don't know about that. that. No, no, no. Whoever remakes it. Doesn't the matter, Beatles. huh? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, okay. Well, then in 1981, okay. you dropped the Being With You album. Okay. And Being With You became a huge hit. Yes. Number two on Billboard, number one in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, that song has 25 million streams on Spotify still. Fantastic. Do you know that was a hit when you made it? I, I kind of thought it was a hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I didn't know it was a hit when I made it because I didn't really make it, mm. you know? Um, I had written that song for Kim Carnes. You know who Kim Carnes is? Yep. Kim Carnes had a huge hit on one of my songs, More Love. Okay. So I'm hearing More Love all the time by Kim Carnes. It's a big hit for her. Top 10. So I, 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 I know of the guy who produced that record on her, a guy named George Tobin. And he's here in Los Angeles. So I went to his studio. I wrote five songs for Kim. And I went to his studio. And one night, and, and I played them for him. And when I played Being With You, he said, uh, oh, man, he said, I really like your voice on that. I, 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 would you let me record that on you? I said, no, George. I said, you know, I, I've been through that so many times. With me. And every time it turned out to be a great thing for me, I should do that again. But <laughs> anyway, I said, no, this is for Kim. You know, this is, and so he said, man, but I'm telling you, man, I can make a hit record on you on that. I said, no, man, it's Kim. You know, she had more love and, and I thank you for recording more love, blah, blah, blah. He said, okay, man. He said, I tell you what, come to my studio tonight, man. We'll make some demos for Kim. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> so I went there that night. <laughs> That's how he tricked you so, into it, huh? <laughs> being with you is a demo for Kim Carnes. Okay. I never you know knew that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Well, was it around that time that you went to go see Marvin Gaye in Hawaii and you guys had a falling out? I, I don't remember if that was around the time or not, man. I don't remember. But you talked about how you went to Hawaii yeah, to go I, see Marvin. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, I did go to was, Hawaii and we fell out and all that. Because he, he was on he drugs. Fell, yeah, he fell out with me because I wouldn't loan him some money to get buy some drugs. Oh, that, that's what it was over? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What was Marvin on? Was it cocaine or, or yeah. something else? Okay. All right, but then in 82, you guys got reunited. This was when Sexual Healing was yes. out and the two yes. of you guys became yes. close again. Yes. Um, were you noticing the drug use and kind of his decline and so forth around that time? I, I was with Marvin down there every day, man. Yeah, was I noticing it? Yeah. No, yeah, I was definitely noticing it. 
I was definitely noticing it, you know, and from time to time I would smoke some with him, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we put the cocaine in the weed and smoke it. That's the only way I would smoke it. I mean, I, did, I never did the pipe or did the cocaine by itself or snorted it or anything. I never did that, you know. But uh, I would put some in some weed and smoke it, you know. So, yeah, Marvin and I hung out, man. We, 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 yeah, I did drugs with him, of course. Okay. We, we were tight like that. But I saw him going overboard. And he just got to the point where as he was just strung out. You know what I mean? So uh, I, I thought it was going to be a great thing when he went to Hawaii. I thought, I said, okay, he'd go over there, he'd blow out. Because he was athletic. Mar, Mar was always athletic, you know. Yeah. And I say, uh, I, okay, he's going to go over there. He'll, go, he'll blow out. He'll start running again and blow out and get himself together and everything like that. But no, I heard from his from his now ex-wife, she just passed away too, uh, Jan. And uh, she called me and said, you know, Marvin's in Hawaii and he's got, he had their baby with him, uh, their baby, he's named after his brother Frankie. And he said, Frankie's with him and Frankie was only about three years old at the time. Said, and he's with him and I can't hear from him and blah, 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 and I know you're going to Hawaii. Would you look them up? But I was going anyway to see what was happening with Marvin. And I got there and he was, we had a house full of dudes in his house and they, having junky parties and shit like that. And there were no heroin, but they were all doing cocaine and blah, blah, blah. blah. And I got pissed off at him. And, you know, and he asked me to loan him some money. And I said, no, I'm not loaning you no money to get rid of the uh, do all the shit you're doing. That's out of the question. Yeah. So he got mad at me and <laughs> put me out of his house. <laughs> <laughs> so you went back to the United States. <laughs> so, <laughs> went back to so L.A. I went back to L.A., you know. Uh, okay. But, but the two of you, like I said, you guys got cool again around the time the sexual healing was out. Yes, we did. And then that next year, the Motown 25th anniversary show happened, uh, where Marvin actually performed what's going on. Yeah. Um, and you actually got reunited with the Miracles on that show. Yes. How did yeah. that feel? Oh, it was fun. That whole show, that whole thing was fun, man. It was a, it was a great week because, you know, we had rehearsals all that week and everybody, not just the artists, all the writers, the producers, the Funk Brothers. I mean, everybody was there, man. So it was like homecoming. You know, and to see people that you hadn't seen in all who were your brothers and sisters that you grew up with like that, you know. It was a great week, man. It was a wonderful, wonderful week. Well, yeah. The Jackson 5 got reunited at that yes. show. And Michael Jackson performed Billy Jean. Diana got reunited with the Supremes. Yeah. Yep, yeah. yep. That yeah. happened also... <laughs> And that's when the, the moonwalk happened on stage. Mm -hmm. To see that live, Michael Jackson doing the moonwalk, performing Billie Jean, what was that like? It was like incredible, man. It was, it was, it was just phenomenal, really. But it wasn't the first time I'd seen the moonwalk, you know. Hmm. See, people think Michael made up the moonwalk, think he, you know, that was his dance. <laughs> the, the moonwalk came from the uh, Nicholas Brothers. Nicholas Brothers were a tap dancing team, two brothers. Huh. And they came along during the era of Lena Horne. Okay. And Lena Horne has a movie called Stormy Weather. Okay. And the Nicholas Brothers were in there. Uh, Bill Robinson, who the uh, Bojangles, all those people were in this movie. And the Nicholas Brothers did the moonwalk in that movie. But Michael was a brilliant entertainer because he watched everybody, you know? all the dancers especially. So he got the moonwalk from the Nicholas Brothers. And he did a lot of stuff from, from Fred Astaire and right. Jackie Wilson and people like that, all the dancers, James Brown. When I first saw him, he was a little James Brown. Yeah, You know, he could James Brown down, you know what I mean? So, so but he was like that. Michael studied show business. You, when we were doing shows, after he came off and stuff, he would stand in the wing and watch everybody. You know, he was just one of those kind of people, you know. He, he became Michael Jackson intentionally, you know. Yeah. I mean, there's always the, the argument, what's the better album, Thriller or Off the Wall? What do you think? Well, um... It's a tough call. For, well, for my listening pleasure, I would pick Off the Wall. Okay. Okay? Now, Thriller was, of course, his big, big album. Yeah. And, uh, see, Off the Wall had a lot of cuts on it that I loved. <laughs> See, Thriller didn't have a lot of cuts on it that I loved. I loved uh, Billie Jean, of course. I loved Thriller. And he had a couple, you know, Smooth Criminal, 
couple others that well, I like. Criminal came later. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. he he had a uh, uh, beat no, it, what was that? Beat it, beat yeah. it, beat yeah. it was on. Yeah. Uh, so he had a, a few songs on there that I liked, but I I, I loved Off the Wall. Yeah, it was a little more soulful. It was a little more soulful, yeah. and it was the first time that he went over into sort of like a jazzy kind of yeah. thing with Quincy, you know. Mm -hmm. And Quincy, who was a musical genius, you know, took him to that that place. But uh, out of the two, Off the Wall would be my favorite album. Well, that same year, you and Rick James did Ebony Eyes. Yes. There has to be some Rick James stories. <laughs> sprinkled in through this. Well, yeah. <laughs> Rick. This Rick James. I mean, that has to Rick. be. Yeah, Rick, 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 Rick was my brother too. We, we hung out all the time, you know, and, and so well, one of the, almost a prerequisite of being with Rick was to be high, you know, so we'd be getting high and, and hanging out and stuff like that. I never did, like I said, I never did the cocaine and all that, you know, but the weed, you know, yeah. I, I, I liked it. And so, you know, we'd hang out and we, I had a great time with Rick. Rick was a fun person. Yeah, he was a fun, he was a fun dude. And Rick had the heart of gold. He he was a, you know, he'd give you the shirt off his back. You know, he was just crazy. He was just, I mean, I don't want to say that on TV or whatever. Rick, Rick James was crazy. But he was just wild. You can say crazy. <laughs> he was just wild. I think most people would he was, agree. He was a wild man. <laughs> yeah. Well, here you have this long relationship with Marvin Gaye, mm -hmm. with the ups and downs and so forth. But then in 1984, it was announced that he was killed by his own father. Yes. This happened on April Fool's Day. So you yes. assumed when you heard on the radio that it was just a sick joke. I assumed it was a sick joke. I absolutely did. I, I, I was actually coming from the golf course. And at that time, you didn't have no cell phones and all that, you know, and it was still phone booths. And, that, and the guy comes on, it's April Fool's Day, it's the April 1st. And he comes on, he says, uh, soul singer Marvin Gaye was pronounced dead on arrival at so and so and such as. And I thought to myself, well, that's a horrible April Fool's joke. That's not even funny. What, fuck, what is he doing? This, that's not funny. So I switched the station. And when I switched the station, another guy. Yeah, soul singer Marvin Gaye. Brother. And so I stopped the car. I went into the gas. I stopped the car. I went to a phone booth. And I called Anna. And... Uh, she answered the phone. She said, hello. And I said, hello. And she said, oh, baby, it's you. So she recognized my voice. She said, yeah, I know where you call me, and it's true. She said, you know, his father shot him. <laughs> and you started to cry at that oh, point. Oh, absolutely. I could not believe that. Did so, you know his father at all? I never knew his father never at all, period. Father. To this I, day, I, I don't think I've ever met his father. Yes. I, I always wished after what happened happened, his father killed him and or what it was, that I had known about his relationship with his father, because it was turmoilic and 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 and, and tra uh, traumatic for all of Marvin's life. I didn't find that out till he was dead. I always felt like if I had known that, maybe I could have talked to him and said, "Hey, man, so and so and something," you know. But I didn't know. I didn't know anything about his father basically mm -hmm. until after that happened. Yeah, I, knew I his mean, Marvin. Well. Yeah, I mean, Marvin was was staying at his parents' house. He was taking drugs somewhat during this time. And I guess his father and his mother started to get into an argument over some insurance forms that he claimed that his wife had misplaced. They got into like a physical altercation. And then I guess Marvin got into some sort of physical altercation with his dad. His dad came in and shot him two times. And I guess when the police came and they asked what happened and they asked his father if he loved his son, his father said, let's just say I didn't dislike him. I don't know what happened there. Yeah. I, I can't sad. answer to any of that. You know, it's sad. I, I know that his mother just said that he and Marvin had, got a, had a fight. Yeah. And she said, and his dad came. And the killing part about that is that Marvin had given his father that gun. Yeah, for, to protect the house. Yeah, he gave him that gun yeah. to protect the house. See, Marvin in the last few months of his life thought someone was trying to kill him. Oh, he's... The, the drugs were making yeah, him paranoid. he was yeah. paranoid, and he thought someone was trying to kill him. He'd get on the elevator and punch every floor so he wouldn't know what floor he got off on. Oh, wow. And he thought someone was trying to kill him because the drugs had just taken him to that point, you know. So he gave his father the gun to protect the house. And in case somebody came in there to get him, they could, you know, all that. So it was ironic, and I think about it all the time. I think about it now. And someone was trying to kill him. Him. Yeah. He was trying to kill him. He was trying to kill himself. Absolutely. Yeah, such a talent, such a loss. Yeah. Well, I mean, you had touched on this before. You start taking drugs around this time yourself. 
And you wait until you got into your 40s before actually experimenting with drugs. Before I had experimented with cocaine, no, I, I you know, uh, 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 weed or uh, marijuana has always been my drug of choice. I don't yeah. drink. I've never drank or anything like that, except when I was, you know, a young teenager and the boys would buy some beer or something like that. I hated the taste of alcohol. I still do. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. so weed was my choice of, of drugs. So I would smoke some weed. But uh, but uh, I never got off into any cocaine, even though I grew up in a neighborhood where there was everything. Yeah. Everything you could think of was in my neighborhood, you know. So, uh, but I never dibbled and dabbled in it because, you know, I didn't. it took me a long time to even smoke any weed, you know. Well, so I guess you would sprinkle crack into your weed and smoke it that way? No, it wasn't crack. Thank oh, God it was, just, it was oh, before, just before crack. To just powder. Okay. Thank God it was before <laughs> crack. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, yeah, it was cocaine. You know, you said after it, I started doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you described yourself as a walking corpse during that time. Yeah. I got to that point. I got to that point, whereas I was just walking around and, uh, you know, I'm 5'11", and I'm walking around. I weigh 120 pounds, and I can't, I don't have any belts or any pants or anything like that that fit me, and I have to take a pin, a safety pin, and pin my pants on this side and on this side and wear my shirts outside so huh. you couldn't see the pins holding my pants up and all that, and I was in dire straits. Yeah. It was ridiculous, and I hated me, you know, for even letting myself get to that point, you know, because if I could have sat down and written what I wanted my life to be, I would have written exactly what it was at that point. So why am I doing this to me? Why am I why am I getting off into all this ridiculous drugs and all that, you know? And then, you know, but after it was over, and after I went through it, and after I was prayed for and I was healed and God healed me from that, I um I figured it out, you know. I was I was I was I was going through turmoil at home, personally, you know, with with my wife. It wasn't her fault, it was my fault. Well, right, because didn't you have a child outside your marriage yes. around this time? Yes, I and did. then you actually told your wife that. And yes, that, and that caused a divorce. Yes, yeah, yes. She had always told me that's the one thing she said. You know, I've been on the road with you. I've been on the road out there. You know, I was on the road for the first ten years. Y'all on the road. She said, I know what happens out there. Just don't bring me no babies. Don't bring me no diseases, and don't bring me no babies. She said, I'm not gonna question what you do mm. because I only want to know. And so then, I, my, my 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 youngest son was born. Yeah. And I had to eventually tell her, so she put me out. <laughs> so yeah. I don't blame her. I mean, you know, but but, uh, but anyway. Yeah, I mean, uh, most women don't. Yeah. You know, that's usually the, the line where most women yeah. draw. So I was going through a lot of stuff at that time, and I didn't realize it at the time. And I couldn't figure out why I would let myself go that far into the drugs. And then my dad died, you know, and my dad was my man, you know, and just a lot of stuff had happened, you know. And Marvin died, you know, just you know, a lot of stuff was going on that was getting to me psychologically, which I didn't even realize it was. Right. Until retrospectively, I looked back on it and all the stuff that I was going through. And then I realized why I let myself do something like that, trying to escape. But you can't escape from yourself. Right. And by 86, you eventually kicked the habit. Oh, yeah. 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 But I, I didn't kick it. It was prayed off of me. Yeah. You know, I, I went to a church and, and the minister prayed for me and told me everything that I was going through, which I hadn't told anyone in life. So I knew that God told her. She said, God told me you were going to come. She said, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know you. I was praying about a year ago in my prayer closet praying and your name came out of my mouth. And I said, God, I don't know him. Why you got me praying for him? Yeah. And she said, God told me if you don't, he's going to have a stroke from smoking cocaine. So I've been praying for you ever since. And here you are. He told me you were going to come. And she prayed for me. And I walked in that church that night. I was a junkie. I was, you know, I was, I was hooked on cocaine and weed, you know. I came out. I was free. And that was it. I love it. I yeah, love me it. too. <laughs> me well, too. And then a year later, you dropped the One Heartbeat album, which yes. became your most successful solo album. Yes. It, it went, you know, 900,000 copies in the U.S. alone. Yeah. And uh, just to see her actually won your first Grammy. Yes. You had been robbed of a lot of Grammys over the years. <laughs> I mean, to win one Grammy at age 47, considering what your catalog was like up to that point, I think is a little ridiculous. Well, you know you know who I, I compare that to, and I say, well, okay, if it happened to him, it could definitely happen to me. Elvis Presley. Okay. Elvis Presley only won one Grammy in his entire career, and that was for a spiritual song. <laughs> <laughs> he sung a gospel song. He won a Grammy for that. 
Yeah. Now, if Elvis Presley didn't get any Grammys, you know what I'm saying? Well, what am I going to do? Yeah. You know, but, uh, but yeah, but uh, uh, just to see her was that for me. And then uh, we were performing in Las Vegas at the time. And the, the, uh, the uh, club, the promoter came and interrupted the show. And told me, and I wasn't even thinking about going to the Grammys because, shoot, I was up against Michael Jackson and Luther Vandross and <laughs> a bunch of cats. At that point, I wouldn't think about, them. you know, that's out of the question. I'm, you know, I'm going to my, I'm not going to the Grammys. I'm going to do my gig. Yeah. And I won. I couldn't believe it. Well, that next year, '88, you were actually inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, as a solo artist. Mm -hmm. And I guess there was some controversy because you had wanted the whole group to be part of this. Yeah. And they just gave you the solo one. Yes. Uh, but eventually the group got Eventually they got it. I mean, how did it feel to get into, into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Uh, well, you know, I was actually inducted the second induction that they had. The first induction they did uh, uh, Elvis Presley and I think Fats Domino or Chuck Berry, one of those guys like that, and a bunch of people. So I, I wasn't even thinking about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because it was brand new. Mm -hmm. And they were just starting it. Okay. And then on the second induction, my manager called me and said, you've been inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I was flabbergasted. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't believe it. I, you know, I'm in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Oh, that's wonderful. Right. And then in 93, uh, you got the medal for the National Medal of Arts. Mm -hmm. um, in 98, you actually showed up as a cameo in the Temptations movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's funny that the one line that stands out from that movie is, uh, ain't nobody coming to see you, Otis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which you, people still say to this day. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's funny, I actually interviewed uh, Leon, you know, uh -huh. playing David yeah, Leon, Ruffin about this. David. Yeah. And uh, what he told me was interesting was that that line was not in the script. Mm -hmm. That he just basically came up with that line on the spot well, he's a great actor, so he's a, he's I don't, he's I don't a doubt phenomenal that. actor, yeah, right? Yeah. And I guess he, he did the line, and he did it a couple times. And the director approached him and goes, "Hey, you know something? Um, you know the, the the actor is really, you know, he's getting upset, you know, from you saying this line all the time. You know, could you just, you know, stop saying?" It? He goes, "Well, that's the point. I want him to be upset." And, that, and the director was like, "Oh, yeah, you're right. Let's yeah. keep it in." Yeah. <laughs> and it became the big line. The the standout line in that movie wasn't even in the original script. I'm assuming you're talking about um, <laughs> ain't nobody come to see you, Otis. Yeah, no, that wasn't in the script. No, <laughs> it's, it's so odd to hear you just say it, kind of like you know nonchalantly like that when you're used to like the, you know, the the snarled, <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, yeah, version yeah. of it. I, yeah, right, exactly. But I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to <laughs> do it like I did in the movie. <laughs> right. So I guess there's an interesting story behind that line because. You kind of, uh, you know, improvised that while you guys were, uh, you know, rehearsing for it. Right. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you know, I just, um, while we were rehearsing, you know, I mean, I always stay in character. And so we were just doing the scene and that just came out. And uh, the director and Al Arkish, who I just talked to a couple of days ago, actually, um, we were talking about this exactly. He um, he came over and whispered to me and said, you know, the actor um, who I said it to um, doesn't like it when I say that. And I said to him, he's not supposed to like it. Did you see his face when I said it? Isn't that what you want? And he was like, yeah, you're right. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I said it. <laughs> yeah. But... It was definitely, uh, I think, cool to actually have a series, you know, the miniseries of The Temptations, which became an iconic sure. miniseries, and you had the cameo in it. Yeah. What was it like to actually see that played out on the screen with your songs and so forth? Well, I was very happy for them. You know, when they first started to work on it, Suzanne DePass uh, was the mainline producer on that, and she called me and she said, we're doing The Temptations story, and I want you to write the score, you know. So I started to work on the score when they started to film the, the movie. And it was the first time I'd ever gotten, gotten a chance to do a score for a movie. And I was very excited about that. I was very happy. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, um, 
it was a great experience. Yeah, it was a great movie. People it really still watch was it to this day. It really was my my criteria for for movies for uh, uh, for biopics that I've seen uh, is the Temptations miniseries and Ray. Yeah, yeah, that was a phenomenal. My top two. Yep. Yeah, I can see why. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, two thousand nine, out of nowhere, on June fifth, Michael Jackson dies at age fifty. Mm-hmm. Leading up to this, did you guys ever stay in contact? No. No. No, we didn't. You know, Michael had lost contact with everyone who would say no to him. Really? What do you yeah. mean by that? I mean by that, that, you know, especially when he was with Motown, there were people that say, no. No, that's not right. No, you can't do that. No, you can't have this. And he had that. But then he got to the point where he divorced himself from everyone who would say no to him, hmm. including his family. You know, he was just doing whatever he was doing, he doing his life, and he just was, you know. And so uh, he got to, he got away from anyone who would correct him. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, no, I, mean, I, I had no, I had no contact with him at that point, but it broke my heart. Well, yeah, I mean, when you dig into the story and you find out that he had a doctor living in his house that would give him- Anything he wanted. Anesthesia. I remember I got an operation once. Propofol. Yeah, yeah. propofol. I remember yeah. the, 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 the nurse that was giving me the propofol, she goes, oh, by the way, you know, this is what Michael Jackson passed away from, yeah. but we're, we're going to be here to monitor yeah. you. So, And I remember I was a corpse, <laughs> you yeah. know, for whatever, six hours. The fact that he was taking this just to go to sleep was insane to me. Well, I, I had it for the first time long before he died from it. Uh, I, uh, every, every, every three, four years, I get a colonoscopy, okay? Yeah. So my doctor, who passed on now too, uh, the first time I had it, he was giving me a colonoscopy, and he said, "Okay, smoke." He said, yeah, "You're gonna go to sleep now." You know, I was in the in the in the room, and they put some stuff in the IV, and the next thing I know, I'm waking up in recovery, you know. And so I woke up, and I'm wide awake. I have no hangover feeling or anything like that. Like if you get some regular anesthesia yeah. when you, and I have none of that. And I'm, I'm just wide awake. And I, was, and I said, Donald, I said, man, can I get some of that? <laughs> he said, no, man. He said, you can only have that yeah. when it's being administered to you by an anesthesiologist. Exactly. You can only get, he said, I would like to have some. <laughs> but it's, it's a, it's a hell of a drug. And it's so a hell of be a taking drug. That every night. But like I said, see, he got to the point where as he only wanted people around him that he could control, mm -hmm. that he could tell what to do. Same thing with Elvis Presley. You think that uh, uh, every doctor would have given him all those pills and stuff like that. Yeah. They, people, doctors want to be connected to someone they feel is powerful or popular. You know what I'm saying? So for that doctor to be living with Michael Jackson, man, he could tell his yeah, I live with Michael Jackson. I'm his doctor. I'm so, so. so he can whatever he wants. Yeah. They give him whatever they want. There's no way in the world he should have been administering that boy that every night. Yeah, you know that, I mean? that, was, that was insane. But see, then I, I felt sorry for Michael, too, because he was never the same after his hair caught on fire. Oh, yeah, the, the Pepsi commercial, yeah. Yeah, his hair caught on fire. They had to split his head on. He had a plate in his head. And he gave him migraine headaches and all that, so he had to start taking those pills or whatever he was taking to combat that. You know, I, I, felt, I felt bad for him, you know? Yeah. I mean, and, you, and, yeah, to, to hear that he was dead was a, was a total total shock to yeah. my system. I was out with a real estate broker at the time looking at some properties and my wife called me. She's crying. I said, what are you crying about? You know, Michael, uh, Mike, what, what, what about Michael's dead? Uh, Michael who? Michael Jackson. What? No, you didn't just say that to me. You did not just tell me that Michael Jackson is dead, you know, but that's how it affected me. Yeah. And you broke down and cried when you heard it. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. It broke my heart. Well, you actually spoke at the funeral at the yes. Staples Center. You know, I remember Barry Gordy got on stage and he said uh, he called himself the king of pop, but that's not actually the right word. He was the greatest entertainer of all time. Yeah, he was. And no one said, no one, to this day, no one has denied that. Well, for the overall thing of it, for the dancing and the singing and all that. And, and see, I think about that, too. You know, Michael was such a great talent. He watched everybody, like I said, and did all those things like that. And, and the Thriller album, when he came out with that video, and he's dancing with 25 
professional dancers who had been dancing since they were four years old, yeah. and he's out dancing all of them. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I remember I interviewed uh, Ronnie Jerkins, you know, Dark yeah. Dark Child, yeah. who was his last producer mm -hmm. before he passed. Yeah. And I said, you know, and, and Rodney had worked with Whitney Houston, and he's got a bunch yeah. of Grammys and everything. I said, what was it about Michael that was different than any other artist he worked in, you worked with? He said, well, when Michael goes into the booth, he dances full speed as he's recording to the point where as he's done, he has to take his shirt off because it's drenched in sweat. And he has like <laughs> extra shirts. He said he's just never seen that before. Michael danced in the booth so hard that he the headphones were literally would be coming off his head. He had to have like three, three different pairs of t-shirts with him because he would sweat out his t-shirts in the booth. Mm. He sweat them out because he's performing the song in the booth. I remember when we did Rock My World, and he sweat, he sweated out, sweated out that you had to, he had to change three times, and that's every song. That's how much he gives, how much energy he gives in the booth. Just all out. All out. All out. Yeah. Like Michael, when he starts to sing and get into the music, he just personifies it in way in ways that like other people, he's just never seen that before. Mm -hmm. uh, you see Michael record? I never saw him. Oh, dance you never saw him record? Yeah, yeah. I got, okay. See, see, I saw him record when he was when, when he was young, boy. but not but not later on. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, man, a big a huge loss. I mean, essentially, the most famous person on earth passed yeah, away yeah, at that yeah, point. Yeah, that was that was deep, man. Yeah. Uh, well, in 2014, you dropped the Smokey and Friends album with Elton John, Mary J. Blige, CeeLo, John Legend, Steven Tyler from Aerosmith, Sheryl Crow, James Taylor, L.O. Black, Miguel, and, and some other people as well. And that actually reached number 12 on the Billboard charts. Oh, gosh, I didn't know that. Okay, good. Uh, how did it feel at age 74 to have an album that actually was continuing to impact music to that regard? Well, see, the thing about that album for me is that I got a chance to record with a bunch of my friends. And um, that was the most gratifying thing to me about it. I, I never knew how much it sold or any of that. I, I, I wasn't even conscious of that. But I got a chance to record with a bunch of my friends, and some of them I hadn't seen in a while. And that was the fun part. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then 2016, you got the Library of Congress Gershwin Prize. Yeah. And that was a big deal. That's a huge deal for me, man. Because you know, there's there's only a few people in that, and um, for me to be in anything with the Gershwin Brothers, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, that's that's huge for me. Well, and then in 2019, you and Anderson Pack collaborated mm -hmm. on "Make It Better." Yes, that song has 100 million streams on Spotify right now. Fantastic. What I, was it I, like? Anderson called me there. I haven't gotten back to him yet. Mm. But uh, I, I heard that it is some, they had given it something, some kind of gold something, or the record won something that he wanted me to know about. And uh, um, It was a big record. Yeah. I mean, you're 79 at the time of, of recording this. What was it like to really get back in the studio and create a song that really reacted with one of the young, hot singers of that era? Oh, it was fun. You know, actually, Dre called me. Dr. Dre called me. Oh, yeah, because cause, yeah. Yeah, Anderson Pack was working with Dre. Yeah, right. Dre called me. And he said, man, he said, I got a young artist that I want you to come and write a song for or with. And so, you know, Dre's my friend and my brother. So I went and I met Anderson. And he had started that song. And he gave it to me. And I took it home and finished it up. And we recorded it. And uh, it was fun. It was fun working with him. Well, you are... 83 years old now, mm -hmm. but you're still touring on a yeah. regular basis. How mm -hmm. many shows do you do a year? Uh, it's according to what looks good and what, what, what seems like it'd be a good thing for us to do. You Roughly. Know. I, 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 last I year, how, do you remember how many you did? I, I don't even know. How many shows did we do last year? Uh, 45, 46. 46. They say about 46 40 or 50, shows. but I, I don't know, you know. They'll call me and say, we got so-and-so, you want to do this, and if it sounds good, yeah. But... For me, I can't find anything in life that replaces that for me. Singing live. Yeah, there's no, there's no place like it, you know. Um, and like we talked about earlier, I tried retiring. 
I tried being away from it and not doing it and that, you know. And after three years or so, I was climbing the walls, mm. you know. So um, there's nothing like it as far as I'm concerned. It's a joy to go and be with the people and have a good time with them and hear them singing and having a good time, you know. There's no place like it. Well, you and Barry Gordy are still best friends. Still best friends. I saw the the Hitsville uh, documentary. The two, you guys seem inseparable. Yeah. You know, you hear a lot of horror stories in the music industry. You know, people write records that they don't, you know, they sell their publishing, they don't get their proper credit, and so forth. When you look at your whole career of writing songs, do you feel like you were properly compensated for everything you did? Or was there some contracts back in the day that you wish you had done a little bit better? Um, no, I, I don't, I don't, I don't have any regrettable contact contracts or anything like that, that I, that I've done, uh, that were connected with Motown or music or something like that. You know, I've had a few contracts for gigs <laughs> that I regretted, <laughs> you know, but not anything like that. No. Um, see, uh, the, the premise for Barry even starting Motown was for people to get paid. Okay. One of his motivations was, we talked about earlier in this interview, we talked about got a job. And uh, got a job was a, a, a black hit, okay? And so back in those days, of course, the, the main source of selling records was on 45s. So you had two sides. You had Got a job, and uh, one of the songs that we had sung at the audition for Jackie Wilson's managers, which attracted Barry's attention, was a song called My Mama Done Told Me. So that was on the other side. Then we had another song, another record with N label uh, called I Cry, and a song on the back of that just called Money. It wasn't Money, That's What I Want, but it was called Money. So anyway, we knew that um, Got a Job was at least a mild hit, <laughs> you know, so we had four sides with them. And when it came time for the royalties to be paid, uh, we were very excited about it. Barry and I were really excited about it, you know. So I go to his house and we, he opens up the check. And for four sides, for the artist royalties, the producers, publishing, writing, and everything connected to those four sides, this guy had sent Barry a check for $3.19. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we were really, really upset at first. And then Barry said, no, it's okay. this is cool. So he framed it and mm -hmm. he still has it. He framed it. And I think that was one of the real things that motivated him to start Motown. Because back in those days, especially if you were black, the record companies paid you if they wanted to. If they didn't, they didn't pay you. Yeah. And some of them would know, give you a Cadillac or something like that. You know what I'm saying? But <laughs> that was in their name. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not even your name, right? So, so um, it, it, it motivated him. Yeah. Uh, and um, so our motto was, you know, you earn it, you get paid. Yeah. So. Right, because because wasn't the five heartbeats loosely based on, on Motown, but they had to change the name because Barry was going to, you well, know, no, sue them uh, or... Uh, you know, uh, what's my man's name who did the Five Heart Beats? Um, uh, yeah, I can't think of his name no, right hold, now. Hold, hold he on. and I were pretty close to that. He based that on the Dells. Oh, right. Yeah, he had, he had traveled with the Dells around like that. It was very close to the Temptations, though. Robert Townsend. Robert Townsend. Yeah. It was very close to the Temptations. Okay, Especially so that's what I'm saying. The, there is some overlap. Singer, yeah. Like David Ruffin quit and it, it yeah. was very close to that. But Robert says he based it on the Dells because he traveled with the Dells with the Dells for a long time. Right. So he said it was based on them. Yeah, I mean, listen, you, you hear horror stories in the music industry. I remember, uh, you know, the new edition story. You know, I interviewed Ricky Bell. We talked about how they got back off tour with all these number one hits and each one got a dollar eighty seven. <laughs> you oh, know, yeah. you know, I, yeah. I interviewed this guy named Quentin Miller recently. Uh he wrote six songs. He co wrote six songs for Drake. Okay. But he had signed a deal uh where he got thirty thousand dollars up front and he never saw a penny for any of the songs he did with with yeah. Drake. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. six songs with Drake, zero dollars. And, and what you need to do is investigate and see if Drake got any money for it. I'm sure Drake did okay. Well, you don't know that. Not in today's record business. Yeah. 
Yeah, today's record business is a whole other thing. Yeah? It's not nearly what it used to be. You think it's better or worse? Oh, it's way worse, man. Oh, why is that? Because there's no record business, really. Hmm. Everything is being downloaded and streamed and all the people getting your music free. Why should they pay for it? Well, so they're paying a membership fee, which in turn yeah, yeah, becomes yeah, a fractional that, that, penny. That is yeah. so minimal. Yeah. That is so minimal. I heard uh, uh, Mariah Carey uh, taped a Christmas special, uh, you know, and I'm, I, I was watching it. And in one, por one point in the, in the special, they were talking about her Christmas album is the biggest Christmas album in the history of Christmas albums. Yeah. Okay? And they were talking about how she's still getting paid and blah, blah, blah. She said, not now. She said, I did it first, but not now. I'm just earning pennies yeah, and pennies. stuff of it because that's what the record business is nowadays. Well, yeah. And I think one of the things that stood out when I really went into the story of you and, and Motown and so forth was that when you look at the record industry these days, when you look at all these labels like Atlantic and Universal and, and so forth, even Motown is still around, uh, they look at an artist, they see who's already reacting on social media, who already has streams, yeah, exactly. already has some big YouTube videos. They sign them and then they hope for the best. And exactly. if they sign enough artists, a couple of them will become an NBA young boy or a Drake or someone stand out mm -hmm. and the rest of them will just be tax write-offs. Yeah. But in Motown, you had to show up twice a week for artist development. You actually had classes that were required of every artist that was signed to the label, which I've never heard anything like this. And I remember Vlad TV was actually based in Universal Records at one point. So I got to see, you know, how the sausage was made. And I never saw anything remotely like what you guys were doing. You will never see that. You know, I tell people all the time, Motown was a once in a lifetime musical event. Yeah. That was a once in a lifetime musical event. You will never see, there was nothing like that before. And you will never see that again. You know, and especially due to the fact that we're talking about payment and stuff like that. See, that was a great era for the music world. So, yeah, we wanted our artists to be professional when, by the time people saw them. Yeah. We didn't want to, you got a hit record and you go, somebody sees you singing a hit record and say, oh, shit, I'm sorry about that record. Because <laughs> you were not ready to entertain them. Yeah. We wanted our artists to be entertainers. So, two days a week, while you were in Detroit, no matter who you became, to the music world, two days a week, you went to artist development, and it was mandatory. Yeah, it wasn't, you didn't have a choice. You know, it's like going to school; it was mandatory that you go over there and do what you had to do for those two days. Yeah. Listen, what you put together with Motown is timeless, and like I said throughout the interview, as we're going through the catalog, you know, the Spotify numbers are insane. Uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of people are continuously listening to songs that you guys wrote 30, 40, you know, 50 years ago. And, you know, I remember seeing an, an early interview with you in like the 70s, I think. And you said that what you aspire to be is a legend and create timeless music. And here we are decades later. And I think you've actually accomplished that. Well, thank you very much. That's how we're going to end it. Smokey All Robinson, right. it's truly an honor. My pleasure. Thank you. Peace.